Hello, this is Chris Kobe with the League of Women Voters of Portland. You are watching the Video Voters Guide. Along with Metro East Community Media, we are here to talk with candidates running in the May 2020 primary election. With me today is Bob Stacy, running for Metro Councilor, District 6, which covers portions of Northeast, Southeast, and Southwest Portland. Welcome, Bob, and please tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're running for Metro Council. Thank you, Chris. I'm the incumbent councilor for District 6. I was first elected in 2012 and have been serving since January of 2013. I ran for Metro initially for the presidency in 2010 and lost a close election to uh, Tom Hughes, uh, under whom I served for six years after running uh, to serve as District 6 councilor. I chose to run for Metro in the first place because my entire career has been focused in Oregon and in the Portland metro area principally on agricultural land protection, urban growth boundaries, good land use planning in cities, affordable housing policies, um, and transportation. And increasingly, all of those subjects have become part of Metro's wheelhouse of responsibilities. And uh, if anything, that, that expansion has, has increased during my eight years on the council. So I feel comfortable with the issues. I have accomplished a good deal along with my colleagues in advancing uh, affordable housing and other issues and look forward to four more years of service. And those will be my last four years because there are term limits. Thank you. Uh, what challenges to the effective and efficient operation of Metro will result from the pandemic we're now experiencing and how do you propose to meet those challenges? The most immediate challenge, Chris, and the most painful one is that our visitor venues, that's our technical term for the facilities that we either own or manage for the city of Portland for large gatherings, the convention center, the expo center, the performing arts facilities downtown at the theater building, the Schnitzer concert hall, the Keller auditorium had to be closed as did the zoo under the governor's prohibition on large gatherings. That meant that almost overnight, people whose work depended upon serving crowds of people in those facilities disappeared. And we were forced to lay off or furlough at least 700 people, most of them in the managing uh, events at the venues. There are still animal keepers and veterinarians tending and caring for the animals at the zoo. But all the shows, all the ex exhibitions, all the conventions disappeared virtually overnight. That's been very hard for, for our workers, very hard for management. And now we're trying to make sure that we're connecting as much as possible with folks who have been laid off to make sure that they understand all their options and opportunities, both to continue medical care uh, under our plan for a few more weeks and to get connected with the, with the benefits for unemployment that are being accorded to a lot of people, uh, both under normal circumstances, um, under normal state law, and as a result of the $2 trillion COVID emergency funding package the federal government adopted. Bob, Metro is in the process of drafting a regional transportation measure. What expectations do you have that the planned expenditures will achieve state and regional goals for reducing greenhouse gas emissions? Great question. Um, if I were, uh, Bernie Sanders, I would say, I wrote the damn bill that, that establishes uh, the, the objectives for transportation greenhouse gas reductions as part of the 2009 Oregon legislation that made significant funding available uh, for, for transportation in Oregon. I lobbied as 1,000 Friends of Oregon's executive director to ensure that there was a climate reduction strategy for the Portland metropolitan area in the transportation arena. And the legislature, after some controversy uh, and obtaining Metro's agreement that it wanted to do the work as long as the funding was there, uh, authorized Metro to undertake its climate smart strategy. That strategy is a blueprint for allowing us to build uh, many of the projects in our regional transportation plan while also adding transit service, uh, bicycling, safe bicycling, more amenities for walking, to make it possible for people to get around safer by other modes. And it also depended upon implementation of the 
clean car standards that the Obama administration extracted from auto manufacturers in 2009 during the last recession. Unfortunately, those standards are being repealed by the Trump administration. So instead of seeing cleaner cars, we're seeing bigger uh, cars using more gasoline uh, than was supposed to be happening at this time. What can we do about that? By continuing to double down on sidewalks, on safe crossings, on signals and lane treatments that move buses through traffic and not spend money building wider roads. If we try to move more cars, we will increase rather than decrease greenhouse gases. So this is a strategy to make 13 corridors safer for people, um, much more accessible by bicycle, easier to walk on, and, and also get transit moving through them, not just the light rail line that's proposed for the Barber Corridor, but on 12 other corridors, things approaching bus rapid transit or, or faster bus with or red lanes and other features that can help buses get, get through traffic while still allowing access to local business. They have them in Seattle. We, we expect to see them on, on five or six corridors in the region. This is a lot of work. It's involved a uh, steering committee from all three counties. We're gonna be allocating resources uh, for corridors in all three counties, but we won't be spending money to widen freeways. That remains ODOT's job and we have to have an honest conversation about how much more of that we can sustain in our metropolitan area and still reduce greenhouse gases and increase safety. We have time for one more question, Bob. How would you assess Metro's efforts to address the affordable housing and homelessness crisis? Well, as you remember, in 2018, we adopted uh, a major uh, affordable housing funding package with the voters' approval and are building 3,900 uh, deeply affordable and permanently affordable housing units in every county in the region. We're working with the housing authorities of all three counties, with the city of Portland, Beaverton, Gresham, and Hillsborough, which also have housing departments. And we are 10% of the way toward getting plans and designs approved for, for that amount of housing. Uh, I think we're going to be very successful there. Unfortunately, the need is growing, and the current COVID crisis means there will be more pressure on people who are just able to pay their rent in market housing. There will be more homelessness. And so I'm very proud that the Metro Council also voted last month to refer Measure 26210 to the ballot, which will help all three counties uh, ramp up and expand programs and services that work to stabilize folks, to get them ready to go into shelter, keep them receiving the services they need to graduate into independent living in affordable housing, and also keep people in the housing that they have when they're threatened by rent increases or income uh, drops by giving vouchers and rental assistance uh, to, to those households that, that meet certain guidelines. The federal government is no longer a reliable partner in getting enough housing vouchers to poor people. And one of the most effective things we can do to stem the homelessness crisis is to keep more people in the houses they have. Okay, thank you, Bob, for your thoughts. This has been My the pleasure. Voter's Guide. The primary election is Tuesday, May 19. Be sure to inform yourself as to the candidates and the ballot measures that will be there and exercise your right to vote. Thank you for watching.